You have to seek out the people that have already been to where you would like to go or that are still there. There's no point in asking someone to mentor you that has never been to where you want to go and has never done the things that you set out to do. It would just be absurd. Welcome to the My Future Business Show, where we get you in front of your best audience and keep you there. Not only are we interviewing the biggest names in business to help you become even more successful, we're inviting you to book your spot on the show to help you grow your business. So at the end of the call, make sure you fill in the interview application form at myfuturebusiness.com forward slash interviews. Hi, and welcome back to the My Future Business Show. My name is Rick Nusky, and today do I have a treat for you. I'm on the line with Olivia Friedman. How are you, Olivia? I'm doing great. How about you? I'm very well. I have two feet in a heartbeat, I like to say. I can't complain too much. <laughs> You're wonderful. <laughs> now, look, uh, for everybody who's on the call today, we're going to be deep diving into a number of different areas. Now, um, before we do that, Olivia, I'd love to get you to share a little bit about yourself, uh, what you like to do when you're outside of the workplace and uh, where you are and that sort of thing. Well, as far as my uh, background, I come from Chicago, uh, Illinois, and uh, my mother I was worked in the medical field and my father retired from the army and then came home and retired from the post office <laughs> of all places. <laughs> um, but uh, I grew up in the very, very poor slums of Chicago and uh, I just knew when I looked around that that was not going to be part of my future. Yeah. I took charge of my life. And the decision that I made for myself and to do better for myself and my family at about the age of six, um, all of the so-called mentors or people that were in the community were not doing very great things and they were not ending up in very great places. But I watched uh, a lot of, you know, female leaders in other places. Uh, uh, Mother Teresa was <laughs> my role model. Mm -hmm. And um, I just watched her and I paid attention to how she was so concerned about others. And so that was a decision that I made as a young girl that if my reality here in these slums is so horrible, how can I begin with myself alone to make it better? And so I took on the personification as a child, of course, of Mother Teresa. And I took on some of her values because she was the one role model, uh, besides my mom, because she was, she was hardworking, um, and so was my dad. But Mother Teresa really resonated because I felt like um, she just dedicated her entire life to people, but it wasn't for fame, it wasn't for notoriety, it was to genuinely help, and I just thought that was very striking. Absolutely. Moving into the, the more professional aspect of your life, how are some of those values that you've taken from her, have they transformed and shown themselves in, in the workplace for you? Well, that's a really good question. Uh, I believe it has taken more so uh, a toll in my technological mm -hmm. career, believe it or not. Uh, a lot of people would assume that I would do something spiritual, thereafter or maybe you know become a nun or a minister i did accept the calling into ministry in 2016 but the technology is where i believe uh mother Teresa, her presence would be most visible in my life uh, and i say that because i have uh, so many different small businesses grassroots and ngos that are united nations affiliated that are doing great work around the world but they were unable to afford the professional image online, the professional presence that they required to be able to get the traction that I believe that they needed to be taken seriously in the business world yeah. and in their different industries. Mm -hmm. And so what I did uh, about uh, between 18 and 20 years ago, I took it upon myself to be that person, their go-to for cybersecurity uh, I secured their websites on the public, you know, on the front end with the public connects. Uh, I've given them professional websites, man, and I never really thought much of it. But recently, I've been nominated as Chief Information Officer of the Year, which is an amazing award mm. for 2020 because someone took notice. And I just, it's just become part of my life and something that I do. 
And I didn't really think anyone had noticed. So that was, I was quite pleased with someone actually taking notice to what I've been doing for so long. Yeah, that's amazing. I, um, I always like to bring to the My Future Business audience, Olivia, this balance between um, a work life and being so busy, which you, which you sound like you are. Do you value um, quiet time away from the workplace and doing things for others? You know, that's uh, one of the things that I've actually had to work on just as hard as everyone else. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you what I've discovered. Uh, it's a really simple concept that we all know, but I just don't think we take it seriously enough. And it's quite simple, and here it is. If we don't take care of ourselves, we may not be around long enough to help take care of others. It's really that simple. And I say that because I, I my health took a really bad uh, turn, mm -hmm. took a downward spiral turn uh, about four or five years ago. Now, a lot of people say that I uh, experienced, you know, multiple miracle healings because there was no medical intervention. Um, but what really happened was maybe a little bit of that, but more so that I took care of myself. I realized that I needed more quiet time. I needed to take time out for myself. So what it came down to is structure. If you prioritize and then structure your days to uh, the point where you know that you're going to have on Fridays, for example, if you're married, you have a date night with your husband, and you make arrangements for the babysitters. You know, if you're single, uh, then you make sure that you uh, make time for yourself to go out with friends or stay at home and watch a movie. Yeah. So, at the end of the day, uh, what it really comes down to is if you really care about others, then you should first care about yourself. Yeah, that's some sage advice. That's, And it's so easy to get caught in that trap, isn't it, Olivia, that you're working so hard that you uh, neglect yourself and you burn out. Um, have you have you seen that in some of the people that you've worked with? And, and what are some of the things that you've you've offered them to try and help them get back on track? I have, in fact, uh, seen that with quite a few friends. Uh, a lot of people are aware now, now that I'm a, a JD candidate and my candidacy is pending. Uh, I have recently uh, joined on with Pepperdine University out of Malibu, California. Mm -hmm. And ironically, Ariana Huffington, uh, one of her editors, contacted me uh, about an inquiry that I made about Thrive Campus and Thrive Global. And it was really, really amazing when they accepted me to write. They says, we want you to write about some of the experiences that you've had, you know, with wellness. And so what I'm doing now is uh, I've written a really nice article about bullying because a lot of people are under pressure due to social media in the sense that technology has helped us in so many ways, but it's also hurting us as a society. Mm. if we don't pay attention to taking care of ourselves and i guess you call it self-care and so to answer your question a bit more directly uh most of my friends in the legal field as i mentioned before uh jd candidacy pending i notice all of my friends you know attorneys uh prosecutors judges uh they work so hard for the people and while that is to be commended at the same time we must take care of ourselves first. So I see it taking a toll uh, in the law enforcement community uh, and the court systems and the legal systems where I'm seeing the most impact right now. 25, 30 years experience in the uh, medical field as well. Uh, I saw it there all the time. I was one of those people that had high burnout. I somehow assumed uh, as a young medical worker and former United States Navy hospital foreman that just the smiles on the people's faces was going to be enough to help sustain me, but guess what, it wasn't. <laughs> we are mere mortal, aren't we, in this respect? Absolutely. I'd love to learn a little bit more about your experience as a Navy veteran, because I think there's a lot to be said about structure and discipline. How do you think that experience in your life has, has helped you um, today? You know, I cannot say enough about the United States Navy. Um, You've gotten a glimpse of what sort of community I was growing up in. And I wasn't really interested in the army. And I wasn't interested uh, in the other branches, you know, the Marines or Air Force. But mm -hmm. there was something that resonated uh, with the army. But I'll tell you a little story. 
and I want to try to keep it as positive as possible, but I just want to give an example of how important it is also not to give up on your dreams, uh, not to wear yourself out. If you get tired, take care of yourself. It's okay to take a break, but don't quit. So I first approached the army just to find out a bit more about the military. You know, everyone giggled and laughed and says, you're just too prissy. There's no way you're going to make it in the military. <laughs> just forget all about that. You're too prissy. You're the model type. It will never work. So I went to the U.S. Army recruiters, and I think about that time I was in my mid-20s. And I thought, well, geez, I'm probably too old for this, but, you know, I'm a go-getter. I'm not afraid of anything. I am fearless. I was born in Chicago, and I survived that. I can survive anything. So I walked into the office, uh, the Army recruiter, but there was one little problem. Uh, I was well over 300 pounds. <laughs> 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 so, but you know I was serious about it and of course they didn't know me from Adam so I guess they're looking at this even young you know African-American girl you know what does she think we can really do for her is she asking for directions you know we're looking for people that are pretty you know and really really you know athletic and what could she possibly want so they answered a few more phone calls as I waited and I just took a seat and I got the message um so after they finished the phone call, one of the gentlemen came over and he was very, very handsome, you know, trim and fit. It's just amazing. Like, oh, look at this military person. I want to be like that. Mm -hmm. And so I asked him, I said, so what are the requirements? And I guess maybe they didn't really take me seriously. And I said, well, maybe they don't know me from the average person. When I set my sights, my mind on something, we can all consider it done. It's just a matter of time until it's finished. But he didn't know that about me and my level of resilience and, you know, mindset. You know, very mindful. The tenacity. The tenacity. There is a perfect word and I was searching for. So I said, you know what? I said, I'm not going to waste your time. I said, I believe that everything happens for a reason. I'm a very spiritual person. I shook his hand. I said, you have a really nice day. I says, well, I get the feeling I'm going to be coming back to see you in the future in a slightly different situation. But you have a great day, and thank you for the time that you have allowed. You have a great day. I went right next door to the United States Navy. They took me seriously. They told me about uh, a delayed entry program. And I'm not saying anything bad about the U.S. Army. Of no, course, I worked course with not. them as a civilian thereafter. So they still helped me out one way or the other. But the U.S. Navy, it's just, uh, they resonated with me. Uh, the fact that your scores had to be really, really high. And they had this concept of what they call hot fills at the time for your MOI as to what your job was going to be. And they says, well, you have pretty high scores. You could do just about anything you want. You know, what is your passion? I says, well, my passion is looking after people, making sure that people are taken care of. Uh, physically, spiritually, and mentally, the whole person. Yeah. And they said, we've got just the job for you. And it, it was a hot feel at the time. They were in need. And I looked at the details. Said, she was a DC man, and she asked me, so what are we going to do about, about your weight? And she waited. She, she took me seriously. I says, well, I have to get it off. How can you help me? Show me how to get it off, and I'll make it happen. She said, wonderful. Come over here. We went into uh, an office. I sat at the desk. She explained to me about the delayed entry program. She says, I'm giving you this much time. I'm giving you the three-day diet. And if you're serious, you will come and see me in 30 days and you will have dropped 15 pounds. And I did that. And it went on and on until the delayed entry program was running up. And I was due to ship out. And I'll never forget, I had eight pounds to lose and I thought I was going to starve myself <laughs> to make it happen. But then there we are, wellness again. And I thought, I said, you know what? This is the rest of my life. I feel like the Navy is the turning point. And definitely it was. From there, you've gone on to become a business expert. Uh, you talk a little bit about in your bio how you can get people in front of their businesses. And it's, what are some of the things that the strategies that you're referring to? Uh, I seem to have a gift. I can walk into a business or size up a business online fairly quickly by asking a series of questions and, and very shortly we'll get to those series of questions. Uh, but for the most part, I can size up the business 
I'll figure out almost immediately what's wrong. And it's not always good because if you give me permission to come into your business, sometimes it may come down to me ripping it up one side and down the other. And here's what I mean. Well, I'm not referring to firing people uh, as much as I'm referring to restructuring the business. Uh, often we have different passions uh, in different industries and we feel that we want to get in there and make an impact. And then when we get there, we realize, oh, there's this problem, there's this problem, there's that problem. Oh, what have I gotten myself into? Mm. So just about any type of business situation, even if that is the case, I can come into the business, sit down with the business owner and ask them, what is it that you're really wanting to accomplish so that we can find the path there? If it's something that just seems so, you know, out of reach, I would actually be honest about that, but it's very often that um, I tell people that it can likely be done, but it's going to take a lot of hard work or it may take you some time. So I'm very, very honest uh, about the survey. Mm -hmm. And that's really important because a lot of the times people are, you know, given what you call a pipe dream, you know, the phrase, uh, you're given a dream that is just really not achievable at the time or at any time <laughs> sometimes. And then these people, you know, the business owners, they put their life and some people will mortgage, you know, leverage their homes, their mm. equity in their homes based upon a lie. And those are the type of businesses that I end up saving. And if they're wanting to get to the next level, I'll explain to them what it's going to take and they're either going to tell me yes or no. So, but the sort of questions that I ask are the first three. Where are you now? Where do you want to go? And what is your plan for getting there? Three simple questions. Mm -hmm. And based upon how those questions are answered, I have a pretty good idea how we might want to execute the plan or if the plan is even achievable at that point or if other things need to be accomplished first. You, you talk about um, the importance of being great and relentless when building a startup. Let's assume that the person that you've just consulted with, you've given them those three those three questions. You've you've recognised that they have something that's valid and it's achievable. What is this idea of being uh, great and relentless? Great and relentless is about mindfulness. It's a mindset. Mm -hmm. uh, growing up in Chicago. If you can imagine uh, waking up every day, I'm not waking up to a bed of roses. I'm waking up to, you know, I don't want to sound too negative, but, you know, gunshots and, you know, police sirens. It's like a war zone mm -hmm. in Chicago when I was growing up, and I hear it's worse now. But if you can imagine the importance of mindfulness and uh, visualization, along with action, of course, um, and imagining yourself somewhere else and holding on to that dream for dear life that's what i mean about being great and relentless you have to know that you are great you have to convince yourself because guess what if you can't convince yourself that you're great nobody else is going to believe it either. no <laughs> i am um... I'm looking at all of your experiences and your awards. Could you talk us through a little bit deeper about uh, women in tech, businesswoman to watch in 2020? All of these accolades are coming uh, your way and how they came about for you. You know, it's, it's an interesting wave uh, that I'm riding right now. I have been, I had been in the healthcare field for 25 to 30 years and I'm not that old, I started very young. Mm -hmm. And uh, same thing with technology. Technology was another escape for me when I was younger. Uh, I remember I explained to my grandfather the importance of Microsoft and, you know, IBM ages ago. And he asked me, he says, well, you're a girl. How do you know about all of this, you know, sun microsystems, you know, sun systems? How do you know about all these things? And how do you know that this is going to be some interesting stock and something that I might want to invest in. And I says, well, Grandpa, you know, they're changing the future. This is the future, this technology. And I explained to him, I says, you know, one day everyone will have one of these computers on their desk and it will be commonplace. And he says, no way. So he laughed. He says, well, let me look into it. Uh, he found a way to uh, invest in Microsoft. Uh, a very long time ago, and that 
proved to be very, very fruitful. But as far as women in technology, I personally believe that there is a place for women in technology that we as human beings are missing, not even just the tech industry mm-hmm. um, and, and not even just the business you know, industry or corporate America where we talk about the glass ceiling all the time. It's a little bit deeper than that. I believe that we need a woman's touch in business the same as we need a woman's touch in the home. Uh, the workplace is not complete without a woman in some capacity in that I know that when I sit down and I work on technology projects and I work on them with men, I notice how after a while they will call me dude or something like that. <laughs> so, <laughs> what we... What we're witnessing is it's a good thing. I always thank them and I always say thank you for the inclusion and they just laugh so hard. They're like, we, we, we like what you're saying, but I'm not sure we, I understand what you're saying. And I always explain that when you call me dude or hey man, what you're really saying is that I'm part of the group even though I'm a gal. <laughs> <laughs> so, and they all get a kick out of that. There is a shift. Uh, that is taking place right now where I see a lot of women coming into uh, prominent positions of authority. And I did a little research on ancient Egypt. For some reason, I always end up back there in my research. And I wanted to know, it was just a knowing that I had to decipher. I was like, I was trying to hack my own brain for ancient wisdom, right? And I went to check the uh, rights and responsibilities that an ancient Egyptian woman had versus other women. And lo and behold, I found out that they were considered to be equal to the men. It was shocking. Uh, It was astounding because the first thing that comes to mind when we talk about women in IT or women in tech is we think about women's suffrage, you know, from when we came, when women were not able to vote you know, uh, and that we are still dealing with uh, income inequality and that it will take another 170 years uh, before our income as women in certain positions or as C-suite executives to equal that of men, 170 years. So I decided I just don't have that long. <laughs> so, but it, it was really astounding to, to, to see that. And But it, it brought along with it a realization, almost like a confirmation of what is happening Today, we look at the presidential uh, candidates uh, that are female, and it's just, it, it is time. I would not be surprised if by some miracle we had a woman elected for president of the United States of America. You, you talked a little bit before about how you were essentially, I guess, mentoring somebody to understand that technology will be the way of the future, and, and they ended up investing. I wonder, from a mentorship perspective, how important is a mentor and how do you find them? Well, see, that's the thing that's really interesting. Uh, it A lot of people assume that it depends on your industry, and sometimes it does, because you want to have someone that is an ex- expert in your niche yep. or that is an expert you know, in your line of work, of course. But at the same time, uh, what I'm finding as far as mentorship uh, and then for women in technology... I found myself returning back to the military, and I'm also a member of the Phi Alpha Delta Law Fraternity out of uh, Virginia, Maryland, and D.C., Mm -hmm. uh, with the AMU and APUS. And I find that it's those type of structures that uh, keep me on point and keep me with a nice pool of great candidates uh, for mentors, uh, as well as maybe a, a person's place of worship. Uh, and uh, for me, of course, the United States Navy. Um, and then there's also uh, Jane Creekmore Smith, who's an attorney uh, out in uh, Huntsville, Alabama. These women are considered to be, like in Janie's example, she is considered to be a super lawyer. Uh, so I have her as a mentor, and I met her when I was doing mediation and conflict resolution at the courthouse in Birmingham, Alabama. And then, of course, the other lady, she is on the executive level in the government already. So the big thing with me uh, is that everyone wonders, why do you have so many millionaire and billionaire mentors, and how did you get them? Mm. How do you convince them to mentor you? 
it all comes down to realizing that you yourself deserve the best of the very best why would you cut yourself short why would you find a, a seek someone that's mediocre if you're wanting to achieve great things and so we find ourselves right back at the great and relentless you have to be relentless when you are contacting uh, people of wealth people of stature people that have achieved the type of uh, success or level of success that you seek you have to seek out the people that have already been to where you would like to go or that are still there there's no point in asking someone to mentor you that has never been to where you want to go and has never done the things that you set out to do is it would just be absurd you know, this is coming back to that thing we spoke about earlier about mindset and almost as if you need to believe that you have already achieved these things. Um, yes. So, you know, if you don't believe it, how are you going to achieve it? Absolutely. Now, I, I'm so glad that you mentioned that because there's a lot of buzz right now and everyone's asking me, you're a spiritual person. What do you think about the law of attraction? Uh, what do you think about, you know, visualize it? you know, and it will come, well, there has to be action. Mm -hmm. There are laws of the universe, whether you consider yourself to be a spiritual person or not. Uh, if you light a match to something, it's likely going to catch fire. Um, and it doesn't really matter who you are. If it, one gentleman says, if you stand at the top of a building and, you know, be unfortunate, why would you do that? But if you jump, you're going to fall, the same as everyone else. So it's not as if... Uh, success uh, is, is just so elusive uh it's really about getting the work done you have to be willing to put the time in and the work uh, here's here's a concept one of the books that i'm working on right now is called uh divine theory uh divine gifts theory and so the divine gifts theory talks about divine intervention i talk about tesla when I get into the chapter on technology, Tesla, like myself, receives what you call tech dreams. He would receive flashes of light while he's wide awake. I would lie down at night and get flashes of light before I see new inventions. Eight years old, I saw a drone and uh, my family called me years ago and says, oh my goodness, that's the flying spider that you saw wow. with uh, cameras for eyes, <laughs> uh, you know, at, you know, before 10 years old. And so I get the tech dreams, but divine gifts theory talks about Gladwell's 10,000 hour rule. And that's what it disputes. Uh, I have worked within that concept. I believed in it firmly, but then I fell short. I worked tirelessly. I worked myself really, really hard. I made sure that every single day I did everything within my power to make things work and to do everything I felt I needed to do. For that startup, uh, that was Legal Booking Pro, uh, to help lawyers schedule uh, in half hour increments for their clients so that they wouldn't have to build them for a whole hour at a time if they didn't spend an hour. I thought it was unethical. So I wanted to address that issue. But that's a perfect example. And it was well over 10,000 hours. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> By the 10,000 hour mark, I realized it was going to need twice that much time. So I thought about this, well, I don't want to go around disputing, you know, uh, great people's theories, but I do want to equip the masses with something that they can use. How can I translate what I've experienced to everyday business, uh, everyday doings, and getting only three to four hours of sleep per day to make that software happen? How do I translate the passion that I was feeling? And so what I realized is that at these different junctions, I would look through my journal, I'd turn the page and I'd go, and I'd look here, and I'd look at the next page and I'm like, wow, there's been a lot of wow moments throughout this process. Eureka moments, mm -hmm. one after the other, after the other, after the other. One night I would stay up later because I felt there was something that I needed to receive so whether you want to call it inspiration, you hear the right song come into your earpods, you know, from your iPhone, uh, you're listening to Pandora, whatever it is that inspires you, there are those moments where you know like you know like you know. Yeah. Had you not been there at that moment doing that thing, looking at that issue, 
with those situations and circumstances or a problem that you need to overcome at that time, you would have never come across that goodie. That epiphany or that solution. It's amazing. It's amazing how it works. Uh, but you have to be willing to put the hard work and you have to be willing to do the work and make sure that it's something that is authentically yours, that you're passionate about. Because, you know, news alert, uh, motivation alone will not cut it. It's not going to get the job done. You have to be passionate about what you're doing. This is some wonderful advice. I've really, really enjoyed this call. I, I wonder, um, for those who are looking to get access to the Legal Booking Pro, where are they going to find that? Yes, it's actually at legalbookingpro.com. And uh, what we're doing right now is we're going through the second stage of beta testing because I have also written the uh, software, the first court mediation software that's eligible to meet the requirements for Alabama State. Everyone had been doing the classes in person. Uh, so the Legal Booking Pro is at legalbookingpro.com. And uh, but we're going to be coming out with something really, really cool right around the same time we come out with the book, uh, Divine Gifts Theory, because a lot of people are like, are you going to leave the title, the same title? Yes, I am. Mm -hmm. And I will let all of my friends know that there's tons of business information there that whether you're spiritual or not spiritual, you definitely want to pick up the book and it will be out on June 15th. Thank you so very much for, for sharing this. Now, as I always do, I will be making a write-up and a series of links back to Olivia. Olivia, thank you so very much for spending some time with me on the My Future Business Show today. Thank you so much for having me. You've been a joy. Thanks for joining us today. If you enjoyed the call, then make sure to subscribe, leave a comment, share us with your friends and book your spot on the show at myfuturebusiness.com forward slash interviews. And if you're looking for solutions that will help grow your business, then visit myfuturebusiness.com forward slash shop.